Welcome back, welcome back to another episode of Real Talk. Ghost, how's your week been? Fantastic. Great, great, great. Fantastic. fantastic. I think I'm having a fantastic week too. But I just seen something that disturbed me, right? And so, I don't even know how old this this clip is. I don't know how old this video is. And let me just be honest and say on the record here that um, I only seen a clip. I, I haven't seen the, the entire sermon of something, mm -hmm. but it stirred me up to say, you know what, let's just do an impromptu Real Talk episode very, very quickly to, to address something. Now, we talked about contending for the faith a couple episodes back, and um, you had talked about before uh, a couple reasons why people believers don't want to contend for the faith, one of them being conflict, they don't like conflict, and the other one was, um, we live in this postmodern world, right? And you probably may hear this a couple more times in, in different episodes, the way this like postmodern world has really like even jumped into the church. Um, this idea that there are no absolute truths, that everything is just basically an opinion. Mm -hmm. What's true for you, it's true for you. It may not be true for me. Mm -hmm. And while I value people's opinions, and I think that that makes people unique and different, there are things that are truthful, and we must weigh them against a standard. If I was to tell somebody that, um, or if somebody was to tell me that rape is wrong, and I asked them, okay, well, what's the standard that you use to, to say to rape determine is wrong? That. Yep. And they say, well, my grandmother said that, you know, these, these things are wrong, boom, boom. And then I say, okay, well, that's dealing with something moral that, you know, you, you go to your grandmother as that standard. And then I say, um, yo, so is cheating wrong? And you're like, yeah, I think that's wrong too. And I'm like, oh, okay, bet, your grandmother told you. No, actually my grandmother is okay with uh, cheating, but you know, I'm not, so I feel like it's wrong. But wait a minute, you just said your moral standard for which you say something is right or wrong, mm -hmm. just told you this was correct, or, correct good. Yeah. or good, and you're saying it's wrong. And we're living in this world where that's okay. Like, we're okay now that there's no standards on in categories to judge anything. And now we're just, like, out here in this world living and trying to say, and we're, we're angry. We're angry when we see things that are wrong in this world. But my question, as I get into the clip that I really want to get to, is how are you really angry without any standard to say or justify your anger? Well... So there's two things there. Let me re let's back up real quick. Well, we still haven't got to what my. That's okay, because it still works with the the thought process. Yes. It's okay to be angry. Be angry. You're that's natural. You're gonna be angry. Yes. The problem is is when you try to standardize your anger without any origin right. to work from. Right. 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 You know what I'm saying? Yes. So I don't want us to. I don't want y'all thinking that when we when Jack and I talk, we're telling you. You know, you can't be angry. You're, that's no. an emotion. Yes. That's something that is impossible for you not to do. It's when you impose your anger as a standard and then you work from that ideology like your anger justifies your standard. No, that's, you can't do that. You can be angry. That's cool. Again, that's, your, that's where you are. That's what makes you an individual. It's when you want to say that whatever it is that you're angry about in your belief system that work that is being challenged by the thing you're angry about, you claim that to be a standard now. And we're saying, how, when you're not working for money, anything other than your own self? That's a problem. Because now, you're, you're, you're ruling, you're ruling, you're ruling, man, we got, it's live up in this place today. Yeah, that's just how it is on the, on the set of real time. We got people in the background wilding. Um, but it's you're, yeah, when you're trying to make your standard your own your own standard, and then other people can have the same logic. Like all of a sudden we have twenty standards. It doesn't work. Right. So the the so where did all of this come from, Jack? You started off with this saying that you're disturbed about something. Then you jump into this postmodern view. Where what's going on? I've seen a clip, okay, from Creflo Dollar. In the clip. Well, that's a controversy right there. Just bring up that name. <laughs> right. It's going to bring is, up conflict. Which is fine. Which is fine. Uh, I don't have a problem with this. 
So conflict is not a, is not an issue for me, so long as I know where, I, where I'm going with it. And in the clip, it said he states, "Burn all my books that you ever heard me preach or teach on when it comes to tithing. Get rid of them. Burn my books. Don't listen to none of my sermons. Like get rid of all these things." And he, he breaks down and goes into how people have, have taught and preached on tithe himself, based upon it being fear and religion. And he had this nonchalant way about him in which he just stated, like, you know, I'm probably going to lose some friends for this, but I've already lost some people anyways. And, you know, that was kind of the end of the clip. All right? Now, people have different mindsets and things of, of, of what's going on and well, you know, are you going to give the money back? Like, are you going to do things? But my first initial thought was, why did we allow somebody like this in the first place to get away with something that was being taught falsely? Because he states also in the clip that he's been doing some corrective teaching, which means what he was teaching before was, was wrong. Error. It, was, yeah. it was error, yeah. right? So now he's saying all these years later now that he's changing his, his, his teaching. And going back to this like postmodern view, if we were to call out Creflo Dollar back when he was saying these things, because it's happening even now today amongst people in the church, which is the frustrating thing, they would tell you, you shouldn't judge and, and you shouldn't do all these things and, and, you're, and you're wrong for coming at the man of God. So we're supposed to wait for the man of God or the, the pastor, the preacher to come back years later and tell you, I've been teaching you something wrong and just get rid of all of those things now and focus on what I have to say now. After he done passed it on to your grandmother, who done passed it on to your mom, who done passed it on to you, after he's probably destroyed people's bank accounts, people's families, and just now the doctrine that he's put in people's minds, millions have been led to think these things are true. Why is it that everybody may be probably okay now with him making the apology and everything is cool now instead of why were you upset with the people who were calling him out from the beginning when he was preaching these things? And to me, I just see this postmodern worldview creeping into the church where we're allowing teachers and preachers because of titles to now have their own truths, tie it to the word of God, and then say, believe it. And if you don't believe it, now you're the bad guy. Now we don't want you in our parties. Now, now you're no longer part of the, the, the unities. Don't come to our conferences. Don't come to our convocations. Don't come to none of our discussions because you're just sowing discord. I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated, uh, Pastor. And I guess I'm frustrated because in the midst of all of this, it seems like the point of truth is, has become the pastor or preacher instead of rightly dividing the word of God and going through the standards. Mm -hmm. So I'm frustrated because now we're okay because Creflo says, hey, I, I was wrong about that, so now let's forgive him. And so good. I'm going to ask that. We're, I'm gonna, this is like clearly off the cuff now, okay? Well, we are. We are off the cuff. Quite, I have a question for you. That's fine. It's real talk. Do you feel like the, where your frustration is coming from because you see what damage he's done? Absolutely. Hold on. I have not finished. I'm, I'm walking. I want to walk through your line of thinking. Yes. You see the damage that's been done. You know that people rejected the rebuke that he should have been getting in the past. The same people now are accepting his apology, and we're just now stopping from where he left off, saying, "Burn my books and let's move on." And these people are now moving on. Are you upset? Because you feel like he should suffer some kind of penalty or punishment? No, no, no. I'm asking okay. a specific question. <laughs> got you. Got you. No. Because I'm like, your frustration is still the same frustration we've had when we started this whole thing. Ever since you've been coming to our church, this is what the CCA does. This. This is what we do. We 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 do this. We explain. So I guess what I'm saying is, I don't know where your frustration is. That's different. Other than that's why I asked the question, are you mad that he's not being punished or he's not getting rocks? And I'm not trying to expose you. I'm just asking, are you upset because you feel like somebody should be throwing rocks at him or he should suffer? Because I, I have something that I would like to see happen, but I'm just, you know. I, I, my, my frustration comes from the fact that the power keeps being given to 
a person in a title that has misrepresented something for you to clearly see. Yeah. If, if we look at, uh, and when we go through the text of seeing what a bishop should be, an overseer should be, and, and one of the huge criterions is that, you know, to be able to rightly divide the word of God. Yep. And we're not saying some people can't come back and teach something different, but when we're saying four years, you profit. 20 years, damage, over 20 years. And now all of a sudden, now it's like, you met your quota and you're fine and you're good. And now everybody's just like, all right, well, that's the man of God. Let's not say anything. Hey, it is what it is. No, what about the fact that God entrusts his shepherds to take care of the sheep? So we're going to ignore the fact that he damaged sheep who left? People who got banished because they didn't pay tithes? And what, what about those people who may have left the church because of these things? So my frustration comes from the fact that the church is just so accepting and forgiving to not hold the, the people in charge accountable to the word of God and rightly divide it. We've lost that, and we've made people who do that now, you're just, you just want to defend. You, you just, you're just, why are you such an antagonist? Why do you, why do you care so much about Creflo Dollar? You should be praying for him. You should be. I am praying for him, but what about all the sheep that has been damaged, that has been that's been jacked up because of these teachings? Yeah. What? You, so that's the frustration. Do you know one of the uh, rules? Audience. Do you know what one of the rules of accountability is? Rules where? One of the rules of accountability. One of the criteria for accountability, like to manifest accountability, for accountability to be identifiable. Like I see you being accountable for your actions. Do you know what one of the this? Well, standards I, are for I, I guess one of them would be uh, apologizing, right? Or, or owning up from, from what you Okay, done that's wrong. one, but I ask you, I, okay, so that's one, yes. There's other criteria that shows that an individual is truly being accountable for their actions. Well, I have one, but I don't know if it is. Go ahead. You have to repay for the wrong or Absolutely. The that you've done. No, you you restore or recover the injury or the damage. Like you own it, right? And then therefore you do as best you can to correct it. So Zacchaeus, you remember Zacchaeus? Underneath the sycamore. Exactly. Do you know what his job was? Do you know what he was doing? You know what his what he was in the Bible? Uh was he a tax collector? He was a tax collector. Alright, you asked the question but that you wanted to keep going. Right, go That's all I wanted was tax collector. <laughs> So you answer. <laughs> now, after he meets Jesus, he, he meets Jesus, he experiences Jesus, and after he experiences the truth, what does he do? Does he just apologize? Does he stop there? Yes or no? <laughs> no, he doesn't. He, he doesn't. does not stop there. Y'all with me? So one thing is, he's accountable by saying, I wrong people. He... By him being confronted with the truth, which is Christ, he acknowledges he has wrong people. That's one step to accountability, okay? The next step is he not only uh, uh, recognizes he was wrong, he then restores more than what he has taken yeah. Yeah. to correct the error. Why is that so important in a society where accountability allows transparency and trust to be established. Because once you start healing the wound that you've caused, people will be more open to forgive and to accept you and understand you're a trustworthy person now. How am I gonna trust you by you just simply saying, oh, I apologize, but you're still allowing people to suffer in the damage that you have caused. Now, you doesn't mean that you can control or heal all of it or to restore all of it. But Zacchaeus not only said, I'm going to give back, I'm going to give back more than what I've taken to the individual that he knew he took from. You with me? I'm with you. So That's a great analogy. when we look at accountability and we're talking about, hey, why are you pointing a finger at Creflo Dollar? At least he apologized. No, no, no. That's a start. Be a man and confront the evil you've done and the hurt you've caused and bring healing to that. Give the people their money back. Drain half of the account you have and give to the people. Those that you know you have postage, uh, you give thank you letters, send each person $1,000. Why not? Because now what you're doing is you're actually owning the wrong that you have done for years and you're giving back to those that you have taken from, and you're giving back to them. 
That's accountability. That's owning the wrong. You may not be able to get to everybody. You may not be able to completely restore all the wrong you've done, but make a manly, a manly effort to showing people that you're trying to truly, truly repent of what you've done. I agree. I agree. And I, and I think that example is a great example. <laughs> Seeing how much he, he, he paid back, recognizing the wrong and, and what Christ did in his life. He's like, I recognize this this uh, evil and I'm willing to do this, you know, and I'm willing to repay it and, and, and restore repay it. Repay it, yes. Um, yeah, and I just don't see that. And, and you know, you ask me again, like, Jack, you know, do, do you want to see stones thrown at him? Do you want to see... No, I, I, I don't, but what I want to see from this is to, for people to kind of have some kind of, like I said, I don't know how old I'm this listening. was, but to kind of have some this like aha moment, if you're a person who was like underneath this type of thinking and preaching, enough to recognize and say, these people can be wrong, let me really now pay attention to the word of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I guess my frustration is, which I can't control, and you'll tell me, audience, I, I agree, I can't control this. You tell me this all the time that, you know, I, I can't control that, but I just feel like it's just going to be like, he just got to pass and keep it moving. He did get a pass. <laughs> but one of the things I would like to, I'm trying to find more information as far as what is it that he is currently now teaching regarding giving? Yeah. Because my thing is this, if behind closed doors he's being called out on the tithe, but he's not being called out on the way he's manipulating the mindset of giving, then you're still gonna just bargain with another package. You're just putting the same trash in a different package. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I wanna know. What is his true belief about giving, how you give, the verses he's using in the Bible that he's tying in to make it sound biblical, but he's taking it out of context just so he can create a narrative to take control and advantage of people's weak-mindedness who don't study, and he gives them, he gets them to give. The Bible actually says that Zacchaeus said, uh, he said, uh, behold, Zeke, um, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. That's deep. That's, that's somebody who's owning his wrong. He says, who I have done wrong. If I did anybody cheat, if I had done anybody dirty, If I've cheated anybody. So he identifies that his actions were deceitful. He understands his actions. You're the truth. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my repentive spirit and commission it to a behavior where I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. The other half that I have left, I'm now going to give back those that I've cheated four times as much. That's amazing. It is amazing. And it makes me question how much do we really value truth today? As, we don't. As, as, as believers. We how, don't. How much do we value it to the point that, you know, you know, I was listening to somebody preach on Sunday and addressing, you know, the gospel message. And, and after we accept the gospel message, that Christ is still requiring us to live a certain kind of way. And, and then these things that we should, we should be living a certain kind of way for, we should be pushing each other to make sure that we're living this out properly because this affects humanity and society and it affects their view on God. So, you know, as we talk about justice, if, if we're people who are lying, if we're people who are lazy, if we're people, this is now affecting their view on God because we're claiming to be this. People... Believers out there, you know, like I said, excuse my frustration. I'm not attacking you. I'm just attacking this thought and this mindset to just think the ideology behind what's going on. Yes, the ideology behind truth just being diminished because personalities, because of personalities, or because you feel like I don't want to seem like I'm being so perfect that I couldn't make a mistake either. This is beyond that. I have no problem with somebody checking me when I'm biblically wrong. I encourage that because I know I don't want to lead somebody astray. So it's beyond that. It's about us really sitting back, allowing people to be led astray. And our mindset is just like, well, that's an elder. We can't rebuke them. Or that's, you know, let's just pray for them. You don't know what's going on in that person's heart. And we just ignore 
other verses in the Bible that talk about the effects of doctrine not being sound, the effects of people being <laughs> led astray from, mm -hmm. from erroneous teachings, and we're just like, let's throw that part away, and let's only focus on the verses that talk about mercy, and let's talk about the verses that say we should be trying to restore our brother. And I'm for those verses. I'm for those. But where, why did we remove the verses that hold people accountable to truth? Because they don't want, nobody wants to be held accountable. Everybody wants to give everybody else a pass so that way they can get the pass. That they can create this culture of, hey, let's not be critical, let's not be judgmental, let's not be doing that, let's be open, let's receive each other, let's be loving. Failing to realize that open rebuke is better than hidden love. Meaning, to truly love somebody is to openly rebuke somebody if they're in error. That's true love. True love is telling your son or your daughter they can't have dessert during dinner time every single day. Why? Because you know it's going to affect them, their health. It's going to affect their mentality. It's going to affect so many things down the road that you're trying to prevent. And your love for their future makes you do something now that might bother them. But you do it because you love them. Same thing with the way we educate people with the Word of God as we share with people the Word of God. I still have to share with you the truth or the information of the truth to prevent a future that could be bad for you if you make choices that are not rooted in the Word of God but are rooted in vanities that come from this world. And I have to make sure your mind is illuminated with the difference so that you can see the results. That's called wisdom. Wisdom or prudence, helping you to understand and see something prior to it existing so that you're making the choices that will bring the right thing into existence. You with me? I'm with you. And if people don't take time to take to take time to think about things like that and allow the internal dialogue be challenged, well then you're gonna have people in the church consistently, constantly bring up the idea of Let's be not, crit we don't want to be critical. Let's not be judgmental. We're being a little harsh. Hey, let's be loving. Hey, let's be merciful. Let's forgive them. Where does forgiveness remove the responsibility of accountability? Scripture, where is where? Show me in scripture. You won't, you'll, find, you'll see it consistently. There is a need for people owning their wrongs and correcting them doing what they can to restore. So, um, you know, we just have to be mindful of that. There's, I will say this and we're gonna close. I really wanna know what he believes in giving for today, but I will say this to you all. CCA, we have been teaching that tithe has been under the old covenant for years. We believe let people tithe, but we believe in giving. It is an Old Testament covenant. The thing about people and to church today, they don't, we are not educating people how to interpret or how to understand the Old Testament scriptures. The righteousness of the law, like so many people perceive it to be, is you, you becoming righteous by doing what the Bible says. That's called the righteousness of the law that a lot of people perceive. The righteousness of the law is a covenant manifestation. What do I mean by that? The righteousness of the law is this. God created a covenant, right, that has two parties involved, right? And when one party does their part, the other party is commit, committed to their part. You with me? So when the righteousness of the law was established, when the law was given by Moses to the Israelites, the righteousness of the law wasn't for them to perceive that by doing the Ten Commandments, you now are this righteous person in the sight of God. God created a covenant to where as you do your part, he will do his part. So in the righteousness piece, it's God fulfilling his righteousness through his law he gives to you and I. So if he says, give him a tenth as if he needed it, he doesn't need it. But it's, an, it's to enact the covenant. So that way if you obey the covenant which is given the tenth, he will give you more. Meaning he's going to bless you because it is the righteousness of the law that's, with, that's written therein that as you commit yourself to the tenth, God is going to commit himself to you more. But that's something that in our minds we fail to understand. We feel like, oh, I'm honorable, I'm righteous because I gave a tithe. Now God wants to bless me. No, God already wanted to bless you. That's why he created the covenant. See what I'm saying? 
you, you have to understand that's already there. It's implied by him giving you the covenant that he already wants to bless you. He just wants you to be honorable and faithful enough for him to enjoy letting you experience his righteousness by bestowing on you the promise from the tenth. Are you with me? Am I making sense? I think you're making sense. A lot of sense. But that, so what happens is when you take it out of context, you now establish your own righteousness. You start creating, you start creating precepts that are misguided. You completely take the word of God out of context and you create another subtext that you get people to believe in, but they're now missing the mark for what the Bible is actually trying to do. All God wants you to do is be faithful to him. He's not trying to make you rich. If you get rich, praise God. But that's not his goal. His goal is to make you faithful, help you to follow him. Amen. So yeah, on, on that note, yeah, continue to be faithful. Continue to look over the word of God, challenge things. Do not listen to us. Go back and make sure to see if what we're saying is accurate and correct. That's all I want for the believers, to want to know God more, spend time, research him, know him. That's my prayer. God bless.